3 in the fourth part of the hymnal. And begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But the few there is forgiveness. They're every one here. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only begotten side. Son, to die for each and every one of you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a culminary named servant of that same Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Sojourn. 
I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not lie to one another, you shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you. Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise as we sing together the Alleluia in verse. <laughs> And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. 
But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down to that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Together we confess the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 206. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're talking about some legal advice. It seems to be pretty straightforward. A lawyer, that is a person that is well-versed in rabbinic law, uh, confronts Jesus and wants to know how to follow this law in order to gain eternal life. And of course, the upshot of the whole thing is Jesus asking somebody to do the impossible, somebody to love the unlovable and thereby live. It seems to be rather strange legal advice, but when we understand the history behind it, it starts to make more sense. You see, Hillel the Elder died in A.D. 10. So Jesus was about 16 years old-ish at the time. And then a fellow named Shammai took over. And he ran the Sanhedrin until around A.D. 30. Then Gamaliel, Hillel's grandson, succeeded Shammai. Now, here's the thing. Shammai was very legalistic, and this is the fellow whose party is in charge at the time of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus spends much of his ministry pointing out that even though they're very legalistic, they do a lousy job at following the law. Their heart is not where their mouth is. They're really good at talking the talk, not so much walking the walk. They talk a good game, they talk a very righteous game, and yet they're always cutting corners and kind of seeing what they can get away with. Hillel, on the other hand, was very much more forgiving, and modern Judaism tends to favor Hillel and his disciples' interpretation of the uh, Torah over that of Shammai. 
Hillel and Jesus both stated the golden rule, as a matter of fact. So there's a lot of cultural baggage to be had here. Jesus asked this lawyer, who is likely a disciple of Shammai, how do you read and interpret the law? And the answer calls on Leviticus chapter 9, verse 18, and it takes about 31 words. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and, you, and your neighbor as yourself. So uh, it's just a few words. 31 words in English, 34 words in Greek. Seems to be straightforward, isn't done it? Love God with all you got and love your neighbor as yourself. How hard could that be? Well, even though it's just a few words, it's hard to do. Nevertheless, Jesus does call this the right or the orthodox answer. Uh, but the lawyer then throws out this caveat, who is my neighbor? And you have to understand the, the cultural context to really understand why the, the lawyer would have said this, this person who's an expert in the, the rabbinic uh, tradition. And Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan where the, the priest, and he well may be one of the Sadducees running the temple. He doesn't really want to have anything to do with this man who's been beaten uh, to be half dead. Hemithanes in Greek is not a metaphor. It means you've been beaten so bad that you don't know whether or not you're going to live or die as a result. That's what uh, half dead here means. And uh, the priest who's a member of the, the people running the temple He's like, eh, I got other things to do. The Levite, who would likely be one of these members of the Shammai party, the ultra-Orthodox, we're better than everybody else party, he would be like, eh, I got better things to do. But the Samaritan, the Samaritan whom the, the, the good Orthodox Jews hate with a passion, and the feeling was mutual, uh, he's the guy who stopped to take care of this man beaten half dead, this man who was Jewish, this man who would have been the natural enemy of the Samaritan, and here the Samaritan overcomes this natural enmity, this mutual hate, if you will, and decides to love and be a neighbor to the person who is otherwise hateful to him. And Jesus asks, which one of these three was the neighbor, and of course the lawyer answered, well, it was the Samaritan. And Jesus is like, okay, go and do like the Samaritan did. Go! That's not the answer that the lawyer wanted, because the lawyer was, you know, kind of like maybe Archie Bunker or something, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's my people, I'm for all, I'm all about my people, but not the other kind. No, they, I don't like those. Um, and Jesus tells him to do something that he really doesn't want to do. As a matter of fact, that he really hates doing. That is to love his enemy. Uh, the disciples of Shammai, or as they're often referred to as the house of Shammai, they had a lot in common with the zealots. And the zealots were kind of like the radical, uh, anti-Roman, pro-revolution group. Uh, the house of Shammai publicly demonstrated against the Romans through these public prayers calling on destruction for the Romans and bad things to happen for the Romans and other things like that. And Jesus does make reference negatively to the public prayers of the Shammai party uh, through his ministry. Uh, the Shammai party en engineered and engaged in anti-Gentile economic and social policies as well and they helped to push Judea toward revolution against Rome, resulting in the Roman destruction of Judea and Jerusalem, so that not one stone lay upon another. So what we have here is a politically pregnant parable that asks if you really want to love God, the challenge before you is to love the person that has been rude and mean to you that you would otherwise want to hate. 
See, the Samaritans, they came in after the people of Judea were removed to exile in Babylon. And, uh, and even before then, the Assyrians had started shipping people in, but that, that continued. And so there developed this group of people in Samaria, between Galilee and Judea, where they had their own version of the uh, five books of Moses called the Samaritan Pentateuch. And it was a kind of like Judaism, but not quite. It was just different enough from Judaism to be different. And it drove the Jews nuts. Uh, you know, it, it started with the uh, aftermath of the Assyrian deportation of, of the ten northern tribes of Israel and continued through Babylonian times. And so when Ezra and Nehemiah were back after the exile, you had the Samaritans and other people giving the Jews a lot of hassle for wanting to rebuild the temple. So because the Samaritans gave the Jews hassle and tried to prevent them from rebuilding the temple until the Persians said, no, nah, they can do it, there grew this like blood enmity between the two peoples. And, you know, this, this kind of racial hatred has existed at various times throughout history for various reasons, and even existed in our country. And uh, there's some various elections that have been fueled by racism, not the least of which was the rather infamous three governors after the... Uh, election in, in 1946 in Georgia because uh, you essentially had racism and rather shenanigans in the rural Georgia counties manipulating an election that was trying to essentially suppress the progressive wing of the Democrats in Georgia and uh, push forward the Talmadge party and uh, it, it was a hot mess. So, so the thing is, this is not something that's unknown to us in American society. Uh, it's not something that only people at Jesus' time had to deal with. It hammers us as well, this parable. Uh, it hammers all people, really, in all times and places where an in-group is determined to sit on and bully the out-group, right? So Hillel, who is often referred to as a rabbi in modern times, but was not referred to as a rabbi back in classical times because he was seen as being kind of above the rabbis. But Hillel said, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. And Jesus worded it a different way in Luke 6.31, as you wish others would do to you, so, so do to them. It's called the golden rule. Uh, it is a, a mark of Hillel and Christ to show God as a gracious and forgiving God who is willing to dole out the forgiveness, but then who expects that those who have been forgiven likewise dole out the forgiveness and love those people around them, those who would otherwise be unlovable. And so no one in their natural state includes the people that they find hateful when they are called to love. Everybody wants to love his or her own kind. And so this, this parable kind of delivers the smack down to everybody across the spectrum. For example, uh, about 100 years ago or more, a lot of liberals in Christianity had a belly full of scorn for those people that they thought were backward, who actually believed that the scriptures were the word of God uh, from cover to cover, uh, tried and true, no lies, no falsehoods therein. And what's interesting is the saying, deeds not creeds, originally started out as a Unitarian saying and even was championed by people like John Adams, the second president of the United States, who was a Unitarian. Well, what happened is between roughly 1890s to 1940s, uh, this Unitarian idea started to 
gained wider and wider acceptance among Christians and uh, really wound up fueling uh, the modern ecumenical <laughs> movement. And so you had these mainline churches, so Episcopalians and Presbyterians and, and others who kind of flipped this direction, giving conservative Christians a lot of hassle and, and kind of making their life difficult. And conservative Christians, in the, even in the 1930s and early 40s, were very much a very silent minority uh, in terms of the culture. But then with the uh, Second Red Scare, all of a sudden it became rather popular to be Bible-thumping and God-fearing. Uh, and, and it kind of dovetailed in with the anti-Soviet rhetoric during the Cold War. And so we see conservatives becoming likewise scornful when the so-called moral majority came to power in the 70s and 80s. And they painted those who differed from them as kind of immoral. And uh, they sort of turned the Bible and the conservative view of the scriptures into somewhat of an exclusive club in, in many ways and, and as a, a political movement. And in my 22 years of ministry, I've seen both liberals and conservatives fail to be caring neighbors to their fellow human beings. And, and you know, this has taken some various different turns, but what we see is everybody wants to find their group of people, and that's their, their buddies, their, their good old boy network, and everybody else can go lump it. And uh, that's just not how Jesus works. Jesus cashiers no one. Jesus literally is concerned about gathering everyone as a hen would gather her chicks. So Jesus challenges Christians no less than the people of his time to love our enemies. Matthew 5, verses 43 to 45 says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. <coughs> and the Sermon on the Mount and the parable of the Good Samaritan both are based on Leviticus chapter 9, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so, <coughs> what kind of legal advice is that? Help the people that hurt you? Who does that? Uh, go out of your way for those who you can't stomach? Who does that? But the fact is, Christ confronts us with the truism that your enemy is also your neighbor. You see, we were Christ's enemies, Romans 5, chapter 10, I mean, chapter 5, verse 10. Yet Christ loves us. He came to us and loved us as a neighbor. He died for us. He died for our sins. He replaced our sins with his righteousness. And this is the basis, Paul says, for our reconciliation with God. So if Christ is our master, he who treated us, his enemies, as his neighbor, he therefore expects us to treat our enemies as our neighbor. Now, of course, Christ never abrogated doctrine. He said he had not come to change one, one little jot, one little tip of the law. Not one stroke of a pen, not one little mark of ink would go away. However, he came to fulfill the law. In Matthew chapters 5 through 7, he makes the law more stringent than anybody else. You know, remember the rabbinical law said if you do the dirty deed with somebody who's not your spouse, you're guilty of committing adultery. But Jesus said, hey, if you even look at somebody with a sultry eye, you're just as guilty. So Jesus doesn't short sell the law by any means. But 
he strengthens the gospel. And he says, as you have been loved, so now go and love. We fail at that. People on both sides of the aisle fail at that. People are really good at tit for tat, not so much at loving their unlovable neighbors. And that's why we undermine this whole thing that Jesus is trying to get across when we turn the gospel into party politics, which is what the Shammai party was doing at Jesus' time, and which what so many people try to do today, uh, whether they're liberals or conservatives. Uh, they try to turn Jesus into something that he's absolutely not. Now, of course, what this means is that everybody deserves love, and that means unborn children. That means young children. That means people of all races. That means addicts. Uh, you know, people with struggling with drug addiction, what have you, and other kinds of addiction. It means criminals, it means the poor, it means the rich, it means men, it means women, it means sinners, it means elderly people, it means the sick and the dying. And I guarantee you, one party likes to pick some of these groups, and another party looks, likes to pick other of these groups and make them their peeps. And Jesus said, no, they're all my people if they would turn away from their sin and turn to me and believe. They too shall have eternal life. But no one, no, and, and, and no doctrine as well may be cashiered for the greater good. In my first parish, I was told that the Ten Commandments only count for white people and that other folks can kind of do their thing. Very creative, I dare say. And, uh, you know, after I learned that the, the people who were promoting this were Marxist uh, and very much into uh, certain radical elements of uh, criticism, biblical criticism, uh, that related to their connections with the Black Panthers, it made a lot of sense what they were trying to pull. However, you know, Jesus, on the one hand, does not abrogate the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, you know, apply to everybody. Uh, but at the same time, we shouldn't target people just because we don't like them and treat them more harshly. Uh, so it, it is a complicated thing. Jesus, when he calls us to be Christians, calls us to wade into some very complicated and very nuanced situations. And what it boils down to is we all have a lot of repenting to do because it is our nature to find our own group of people and like them and not like other folks so much. Uh, however, if Christ had treated us like that, we'd all be burning in hell. So we all have to rely on what Christ did for us, who treated us as his neighbors when we were completely unlovable and even offended him. And so what that means, we have the challenge as Christians to react to people when they offend us by not giving them a free pass on the doctrine, but certainly trying to reach out as Christ reached out for us. It is a tall tale. It, or, you know, it's a tall order. And, and uh, how can we do it without the power of the Holy Spirit? But the, the Holy Spirit certainly empowers us to love those who might actively dislike and even hate us. But we have that power. Because God can overcome all things. The early church overcame a, a ton of hate. And by loving its neighbors, it grew like it has not grown since. And uh, it is a challenge. It is a challenge that we often fall short of. And it's just so much easier to import party politics into scripture than to let scripture sit in judgment upon all the parties. Uh, it is so much easier to view the, the people we consider to be our in-group as like the real Christians and uh, just sort of uh, dismiss those who are in the out-group. But Christ who treated us like his neighbor empowers us thus to go out and treat others as his neighbor because we might be surprised 
because people have turned away from the sin of homosexuality and have come to faith and have adopted a one man, one woman married lifestyle and have been blessed by that. People have turned away from drug addiction, sex addiction, and all this other kinds of addiction, and they have got clean, and they have got sober, and they have turned it around. God can take the most reprobate sinner and turn that person into an outstanding Christian. Because the hallmark of Christianity is not that we are perfect, it is that we have been forgiven. And we never concede on the doctrine, one iota. But at the same time, we never do like the house of Shammai and kind of look down on the other people and say, you're not as good as we are. Which is what Jesus criticized during his ministry. And we, we, we rather take after Rabbi Hillel and Jesus. We love the Lord with all we got, and we love our neighbors as ourselves. We do the best we can. We let the Lord work through his word and we put it into his hands, knowing that we, who were called from being his enemies into being his family, also will delight in seeing that same thing happen to other people in this life and to be gathered together with them for all eternity. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all for their needs. Lord, we especially remember those who are wrestling with COVID and uh, trying to overcome, who are dealing with uh, systemic health issues and uh, trying to, to deal with that and, and hopefully make a, a turnaround, uh, whose families are in tenuous situations and struggling with uh, various crosses that they are bearing, who are recovering from medical procedures, who are uh, recovering and going through a, a period of rehab, and, and uh, who are struggling with cancer, who are dealing with cardiac issues, who are living in assisted living facilities, who are dealing with chronic pain, who are uh, dealing with a uh, uh, recent outbreak of cancer and, and are trying to uh, overcome that through treatment, who are uh, struggling with uh, um, sadness, depression, loss, poor health, uh, who are uh, dealing with uh, severe spinal injuries, who are awaiting organ transplants, who are continuing to go through ongoing long-term medical treatments, who are struggling with uh, recovering from broken bones, who are dealing with end-of-life uh, issues and kind of getting everything in order, who are dealing with dementia, who are struggling with various different uh, ailments, recovering from uh, treatment while dealing with COVID and other things, who are uh, recovering from surgery, and who are just struggling with various uh, ailments. And Lord, we ask you that you be with them, that you give them healing, that you give them strength, that you bring them to a, a place of greater health, and that you always, always be their, their companion, letting them know that you are, in fact, the one who loves them, who has treated them as a neighbor, and who wants only the good for them, that they might uh, never lose hope throughout this uh, earthly sojourn, and uh, count upon you, both now and eternal. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We ask that you be with all who are in need of your divine guidance and protection, including our military first responders, medical caregivers, those in authority, as well as those who are traveling um, we ask you to be with the families of those whose jobs put them in harm's way. And we ask you to uh, suppress the violence and the wars and the riots and everything in this world and, and to uh, 
to help people learn to be a neighbor to one another, to set the needs of others as paramount, and to not go by on the other side. Lord, in your mercy. For these and all other prayer requests, Lord, we set them before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy. For Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. This time we'll collect the offering. Please rise as we sing together the offertory we give the one guy now. Christ, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he gave the thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do, in remembrance of me. The same manner also he took the cup after supper. And when he gave the thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Just do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.